All right. So uh, welcome to our November 2020 technical training meeting. Uh, here's the agenda for today, and it's it's not a lot of details on there, but I we've got some good stuff to share with you today. I, I hope today will be a good meeting for everybody. Um, the first item on there is just some training opportunities, which is blank. But I wanted to leave it on there and, and ask the question I always ask. Is anybody aware of any training opportunities that the group is not aware of um, that, that we really should share with this group? If you are, feel free to speak up and tell us about it. Or, you know, if you come across something in the next week or two, just remember if you'll send them to, to me or Wade, um, we'll happily share them with the rest of this group. Uh, so keep that in mind. And then also, I, I along the line of training opportunities, I just want to remind everybody um, that one of our main goals and purposes at the state level is to provide technical training assistance. Um, and I, Dalton and I do a lot of that, uh, but a lot of what we do is based off of, you know, we go look at our monitoring and we try to we try to discern what kind of training is needed. But if we're missing the mark and you guys are just like, man, I really need this specific training or that specific training, just a reminder to everybody, please reach out to us. If you know it's something that is in Dalton's wheelhouse, reach out to Dalton. If you know it's HVAC, reach out to Wade. If it's something I can help with, let me know. Um, we'll figure out whether, you know, what's going to be best, whether it'd be a good one-on-one -on -one training with you or something for your agency, or sometimes we'll, we'll move it to this type of a format and cover it for, uh, the whole program. So, so just a reminder there, please let us know. Cause sometimes we, you know, we might not be seeing what you guys are seeing and we might not recognize the need. So anything anyway um did anybody think of any training opportunities that i was rambling on there that, that we should share with this group all right i'm taking the silence and and the nothing in the chat as um nobody nothing came to mind so we'll move on um so for today's meeting i've got the main topic is actually attic air sealing and uh, we got some cool stuff we wanted to share with everybody. Um, the guys down at, uh, at Mountain Land Association of Governments, so the, the guys in Utah County, uh, they've been trying some stuff They and uh, had them put together some data from about five houses they've been doing some air sealing on. And I just wanted to share their results with everybody, kind of show you what, you know, what they've been doing. And then... Uh, if those guys are on the line, as we get to those houses, we'd love to hear from them. Um, just kind of hear, you know, some of the details about each of the jobs and how well they went or didn't go. Um, so we'll talk about that as our main topic. Um, before we jump into that, I, I had a kind of a little topic that we put here under new business. And uh, just over the last few months, I, I, I ended up grabbing some some photos and a couple of videos of some stuff where I've seen some of the guys in the field doing some interesting things to organize their trucks. And uh, I think most of the photos I have are really uh, there. This is what auditors are doing to organize their trucks. But I, I wanted to share it with everybody. I think even if you're not an auditor or a QCI, you can you may get some uh you may have some ideas of some things you could do to organize your work area or your tools or your, you know, whatever it is that you do um, just based off of what these guys were doing. So anyway, to start the meeting off, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to go through some of those photos and videos of that, and then we'll jump into the main topic. So before I do that, does anybody have anything else that they'd like to bring before the group or, or that they're concerned about? All right. So, uh, so yeah, these are just some some ideas on how to organize your tools that we got from the field. This first one's a video, uh, and this is uh, Jake Lafson out of Utah County. This was his truck. Um, we we were over there monitoring their agency a couple. It's been about a month and a half ago, maybe. 
and uh, he was talking about how he got he went out and he found a rigid box that was easier so that he could clean the outside of the box and stuff for the COVID disinfecting. And uh, we went out and started looking at his truck and I just I just had to shoot a little video. I have to apologize. I wasn't smart enough to turn it into landscape mode. So I shot this in portrait mode, but um, but it's about five minutes long. I'm going to hit play here and hopefully you'll be able to hear the audio and stuff pretty good. All right, so I'm here with Jake at Housing Authority or, or Mountain Lands Association. What are you guys called now? Mag. Mag. Okay. So I'm, I'm here with Jake of Mountain Lands Association of Governments. And uh, Jake's been doing a bunch of audits for his agency, and he's got his stuff set up in a very organized way I wanted to share with you guys. I thought it was kind of cool. So, Jake, what do you got here? Like, so first, we got this pull out. Okay, we got a little rain. So just the bed of his truck slides right on out. Um, and yeah, starting off, I've just got my toolbox, which has all my drill and plugs, uh, electrical tester, and then combustion analyzer for the blower door tape. So you've got all your blower door stuff in here. You got some tape, some cords. Tell me about your your drill. Uh, the drill is still at a 12 volt, just so it's not as bulky as the other ones. So basically, the smallest yeah. drill you can find that yeah. has good power. Yep. Yeah. Then we got extension cord, gas sniffer, um, just all the different the different probes and stuff. Yep. Yeah. I like your uh, combustion analyzers there in your toolbox. Yep. Yeah. Tester, uh, wire cutters, and just anything. Got some plugs. Yeah, check the walls. Got something to drill for your plugs. Major level or major laser. So you got all that in one very yeah. <laughs> fairly small toolbox. <laughs> so you've used your your DG1000 bag, and you've put the charger a 1000 to 700. And then just a and then this is for when you want to go fishing on the afternoons yeah. when things are slow. Yeah. Nice. So just all your probes. Tape, little six in ones, the probes, CO2, tubes, drill bits, yeah. plugs. Yeah. Your I like that. Your your little plug without a ground when you yeah. get to the yeah. older home. That's just the plug adapter for the yeah. charger jumpers. And then the two in one, so that's five sixteen cent quarter, so you're not carrying around two different. Oh sweet. Sizes and then have yeah, just some other bits of stuff in there. Nice. So all that fits in your nice little and all your hoses. Yep, all the hoses. So you don't have hoses and I have hoses in like three different places. <laughs> yeah, basically I can take both these and the all need flow box and pressure pan all in one trip and then So he's got his do you have a pressure pan there, or do you use this as both? Yeah, the pressure pan's tucked inside. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So you grab both of those. So you pretty much grab your toolbox and your DGs and your pressure pans, and you go in the house. And then you come back out and you grab your fan for your blower door and the frame. And then I dig this too. This is just a little Dewalt vacuum cordless vacuum that's awesome and then you're saying how what do you you end up drilling some small holes what do you do with the hose and stuff on there yeah you can pull that hose off and then just suck it up as you're drilling and then with the plug i'll just pull the bottom off i'll just and i'll just put the, the sheet rock plug in there so i'm not carrying around Nice. Oh, uh, so once you once you drill the hole, you'll actually just drop the plug in your in your little portable garbage can there. And then you've got just one of these telescoping ladders, so that doesn't that's pretty small as well. A step stool. So oh, and then what was under your show show everybody what was under your box here? I thought that was kind of cool. So so you got your tie suits. And some gloves, and then a 
a lighter and this is stuff that you use every once in a while so basically he's he's really put everything that he uses every day in a in just a couple of cases so we can get them in and out of the house quickly and and then some of the other stuff that you need to use every once in a while is kind of left in the truck nice so this is inside of Jake's truck. So he's got his his IR camera, the sea snake. He's got a tool bag if things get really serious. And then he's got this basket with some masks, some bug bombs, some other stuff. But these are all things that he really just uses every once in a while. Whereas the stuff that he has to take in every house, he's got that ready to go fairly quickly and easily. So why do you why did you go to all this trouble? What's what's the point? Oh, it's already hard enough, so you gotta be organized. <laughs> so, Perfect. Um, a lot of back and forth and even out the house. So oh, I like it, man. Cool. All right, so <clears throat> that was Jake's truck. Uh hopefully you guys are able to see that. I I suspect the video may be a little bit choppy. Um but if you want to watch that again, when I post this video later today, you should be able to see it a little clearer. Uh, and I also, I did stick that video on uh, our YouTube channel, if anybody's looking for it later. Um, this next one, I think is a video. Yeah. So this one was Shad, also from Utah County. I, I stopped in on a house with, with him and... Uh, and I think Jake was there one day and they had this, they had their blower door set up in a box and it was kind of cool. And it was just sitting on the floor, plugged into the wall. And uh, anyway, I, I just, I, I didn't get a video of, of it in action, but um, basically he takes this box just right inside the house and sets it near the door and just plugs it in and he has everything he needs in there, but I'll, I'll go ahead and hit this little short video and, kind of show you what he's got in the box. All right, so here's something <clears throat> that Shad has. I think it's kind of cool. He's got basically just got a box, nice rigid box, and inside it he's got everything he needs for his blower door minus the frame. He's got his DG1000 mounted here, and then it's, it's connected to a power strip so he can just plug the power strip in. He's got the uh, control to his um blower door sitting in here he's got a gas sniffer some tape all of his hoses in here he's got a dg 700 and then he's got all the smaller pieces uh some probes and uh looks like a jumper wire and a few things like that inside so and then he um uh, also keeps the the shroud in there and everything fits nicely into one box so kind of cool Yeah, so just just a quick little video, but yeah, he basically just takes that power strip and plugs it in, and it it has the blower door plugged in, and his DG one thousand is already plugged in, and and then the box it was big enough to where you can kind of work within the box and get what you need. But anyway, just thought it was kind of an efficient way to to set it up. Um, this next one is from this is brandon so brandon nez down in uh mexican hat he he and i got talking a while ago and i i think he'd already had this envision in his head when we were talking about it i would i i've been wanting to put my blower door on some sort of a cart and he's like oh yeah i've, I've got an idea on what i want to do and and then he, a little while later he sent me some photos of what he did so brandon built this cart and uh brandon's got some fantastic sheet metal skills you should see i wish i had a better photo where you could see just how clean and tight all of his uh bends and everything are in the sheet metal it's impressive but um <clears throat> but yeah he basically just built this cart so it's got a box for the fan on the front and then that that's it's on a cart where that handle i think the handle slides up and down so you can yeah it does it collapses um, but then he just put a box back here for, he's got the shroud. It looks like a DG, uh, 700 here, uh, his iPad and just 
all the all the small things. I suspect he probably has some hoses and stuff in that box. And then he's got another box here on the side that holds the uh, the blower door frame. Um, and it fits in the back of his truck. I think he has to pull the longer parts out of the blower door frame, though. But I thought that was pretty cool. That's my goal has always been to figure out how to get everything that I take into the house on either one or two carts. So just to reduce the number of trips in and out of the house. Um, and that's so I really liked a handful of these things that I was seeing. And that's why I took a minute to just take a photo of them. Uh, this was another one. <clears throat> this was um, Burl Kinoshita down at uh, down in Utah County. He he's built something in his van that I've wanted to build in my truck, and I just haven't taken the time to do it. Um, but I ha I've seen where a lot of you guys will leave your blower door frame intact, and so I do that from time to time. But I end up laying it on top of everything else in my truck, and I feel like it kind of it adds to the wear and tear on that frame. And I've, I've really wanted to do something like this where I'd have just a, some somewhere have a, a narrow sleeve that I could slip it in and out of that it would protect it. Um, but yeah, so Burrow was able to build something for, he's got his ladders that slide in here and, and they're nice and stable, but he's also got that sleeve for his uh, blower door frame. And then he, built a couple other compartments uh, to hold the fan and uh, his flow meters and stuff. And then he also had a, a nice rigid box for some of his gear as well. So, and I know uh, those rigid boxes are a little easier to clean and disinfect when you're leaving the house, depending on how you're doing it. So that, that helps as well. Um, oh, I think there was another slide. This was, uh, I, I don't have a, photo of the of the actual box that I saw. This one came and I can't remember if I was out in the Uina Basin or if I was down in Richfield, but a few years back I noticed somebody had one of these. And uh and then when I asked them about it, they I, I if I'm remembering right, they told me that that's it was an older blower door and the frame actually came from the energy conservatory in a rigid gun case. So whether whether they I, I know they don't sell them that way now but basically if you uh it, it worked really really well just these these long then you know they're like a 30 40 dollar plastic gun case but they hold if you take that uh, blower door apart you can lay all your parts inside there and then close that up and they're in a rigid case and and the parts don't bounce around too much so i liked that just because it looked a little more efficient than uh than that cloth shroud that they come with now it seems like i'm always kind of wrestling with mine and this would just be lay it on the floor pop it open and get all the parts out pretty quickly so um <clears throat> i think that was my last slide on uh on this portion of the meeting or just you know some cool ideas from the field is there anything from for those guys that i uh shared photos of your stuff is there anything that i missed that you want me to point out in those photos? Or as I was sharing these with you, have you guys noticed anything or, you know, that some of your coworkers might have or do that you've noticed is very efficient that you want to share with the group? All right, you're all being some quiet now. Get a little nervous if you. What's that? Some client, some we've had clients get a little nervous packing a gun case in the house before. Yeah, and that that is uh, that is the one issue with that is you'll want to be careful with that. Um, not just but packing. They, they usually just laugh about. It. Yeah, but you could also have somebody walking by who really doesn't understand what's going on that that could get anxious about that. So. Thank you for pointing that out. So every solution may not be the perfect solution because of uh, of other people's perceptions. So, yeah. And I know I've seen a lot, like a lot of other things in your trucks where you guys are very organized and, uh, and you guys are doing um, some very cool things in efficient ways. These are just a couple of examples that I was able to photograph and grab recently because I, I wanted to share some of them. 
but I'll probably bug you guys and, and uh, capture more of that as I'm out and as I see it. Um, again, this is just auditor stuff, but uh, I know we have similar opportunities with, with the field staff to make sure that they have all the right tools and all the right fasteners and all the right things. And that, you know, if they have them in an organized way that they can be more efficient getting in and out of homes, some of those little efficiency improvements can uh, go a long way. So, so especially during this time where we're gonna have a lot of starts and stops because of COVID, uh, you guys may find some time here and there, and if, if you have any ideas on what you can do to improve, I would encourage you to take some time to, you know, make some of these organizational improvements. So, anyway, any other thoughts on this before we jump into the main topic? All right. So, I want to talk about attic air sealing. And... Uh, I, what got me started thinking about this was was this. So during our fall training, when uh, when you guys all came up to the training center for a couple of days, um, during one of the sessions, I I had a field worker came up and and basically asked me this question. He said, you know, the work order says to seal the top plate in the attic. Do we really have to do this? And then he, he said, admittedly, he said, we skipped this one. It was at the top of the list. We skipped over it. We did everything else on the list and we got, we hit our 30% reduction. So we figured we didn't have to jump up in the attic. And then the very next day I had an auditor walked up to me and pretty much asked the same question. He said, you know, I've, I've put stuff like this onto the work order but the field crew is skipping over it and not doing it and so i just wanted to talk about first off i want to talk about you know do i really have to do this the answer is yes you really do have to do this so i wanted to take a minute and talk about why and then we've got a, a bunch of example houses from the folks at utah county that have been uh, trying some stuff with their attic air ceiling and they're they're getting some pretty good results. So just quickly, I think most of you have seen this screen a few times. Um, but the reason why, yes, you need to do the attic air sealing is because we have made it a requirement in our program that the auditors are actually supposed to prioritize the air sealing measures according to this list that you see on the screen. And in turn, the field staff should be installing these measures according to the same priority list. And the reason why we prioritize them is because when you run an audit, you have a limited budget. The audit basically says, yeah, you're going to go into this house, you're going to get a 400 CFM reduction, and you're going to get $80 to do that with. Well, we have actually gotten per prescriptive on our air ceiling and we have said that when you have well, every single house you're going to have a limited budget and it's because you have a limited budget you have to prioritize your air ceiling and you need to be installing that in this order and then once you run out of money that's where you need to stop um, now i know uh I, th I think one of the other issues that we still have based on this is that um it's very, very hard for an auditor to put together a comprehensive list of everything that should be air sealed and then also look at that list and go, OK, well, here's my comprehensive list. There's eight items on here. Now, how do I figure out how many of these eight items we can do with this two hundred dollar budget? Um, and so I, I think oftentimes the auditor will kind of leave that comprehensive list on the work order, um, which leaves the field staff wondering, well, if we have a $200 budget, where do I stop? So I know that's an issue that, that you guys probably need to work out internally. You need to, you need to talk to your auditors and figure out uh, how the auditor can write those clear work orders so that the field staff know exactly what they need to do and that they have a better idea of where they should stop, um, but also that the auditor could, 
could in some instances basically put together you know like okay do these first four things and then if you haven't hit the target or if you haven't you haven't spent five hours in the house or whatever if you still have a little more room to do some more air sealing then you could continue doing some more stuff that one i have yet to see some really good examples of how to do that so i don't have anything to share but i i would encourage you guys to work within your agencies and see if you can kind of find you know figure some of that stuff out and and hopefully at some point in the future we'll have some good examples to share with the rest of the group um but that is why like if if your auditor is listing that on the work order uh he or she has listed that because they are required to list it in order of priority so if you look at this prioritization list the first and highest priority is going to be duct leakage if there's any duct leakage outside the envelope and the auditor has has put that duct leakage together with your other air sealing measures, then that's gonna be the highest priority. If you're a field staff, that is the measure you need to go and do first. If you if your auditor has noted that you basically can spend about six hours in, on labor on this job, uh, if you end up spending all of that on duct sealing, then you either need to stop after that measure or you need to have a conversation with your auditor and figure out if you can continue or not. Um, but duct leakage is first. And then the second one is to do anything between the condition space and the attached garage. That's, that is for health and safety purposes. We don't want to be drawing any carbon monoxide out of the garage. Then the third one is going to be opportunities that can be addressed in conjunction with the thermal boundary strategy. And what this typically looks like is that, uh, if you're going to add insulation in the attic, then this this next priority is that you're going to go air seal before you add the insulation in the attic uh, if you're going to add insulation on uh, the rim in the basement you want to air seal before you add that insulation in so so your auditors are strategically putting things in that order on the work order so that they can capture these opportunities before you cover them up with insulation and then from there then we do the top-down approach then you know, if there aren't any opportunities or that, or if there's enough budget to, you've, you've addressed everything here. Now we do the top-down approach where we go attic, basement, and then the lowest priority are those windows, the leaky windows and uh, the thresholds on the doors and things like that. Um, so anyway, I, I, I think everybody has seen this list a few times, uh, but that is why. That's why the answer to this question is yes. You you do need to do that. Uh, make sure that you are following their work orders. Um, and if their work orders could be clearer, please have some conversations. Please be constructive with those conversations. Work together and find better ways to to make those work orders clear. Make them work orders that are uh, the QCI can come in and clearly check them off and stuff like that. So. So with that, I wanted to share. So, um, Jake, are you on the line? If you are, if you'll speak up, I, um, are you there? He's, he's in with me. Okay. So, um, I had Jake put this together and I, Jake kind of, as he was out auditing, he kind of started fiddling around with a few things. I know it's not just Jake, all the rest of the guys at, at MAG have also been kind of playing around with this and learning what they can learn. So the rest of you guys speak up as well. Um, but I basically just asked MAG if they would put together, just grab five or six of the houses that they've been able to do some attic air sealing in. But, but Jake, can you tell the group kind of what you've been doing as far as attic air sealing goes? Do you mean to actually seal the top plates? Yeah, so like what's what's been your process at your agency? How have you been figuring out whether it's whether there's opportunities and and then yeah, what does it look like when you actually do the air sealing? So basically it starts at the audit. Um, you can do a zonal of the attic. Um, but that's not our main focus of whether a house needs attic air sealing or not. Um, 
one of the main things we've been doing is we have those little zonal probes and we take just a little drill bit just depending on how big your probe is we just get a little bit bigger of a drill bit and we just drill a couple holes into interior walls and then we put that probe actually in that wall cavity and with our blower door running um so a tight a tight top plate seal would be you know zero pascals um but sometimes we've found close to 40 pascals if you've got a big gap around your top plates leaking down that wall um, so that's kind of a better way to determine how much top plate leakage you have compared to just running a straight zonal of the attic. Nice. So, and for everybody else, that was Shad Jeffers was speaking there, and and Shad's been involved with this heavily as well. Um, but yeah, there. So you guys are, you're basically just drilling a couple of like, is that like a three sixteenths inch hole in the wall, just something big enough to stick those small probes that come with your dg 1000 into the wall is that what you're doing yeah yep and then you can just caulk over it after or whatever and that when i i watch jake do it he basically is putting it just above the the baseboards so that it's he's caulking kind of right on that little joint where there's caulk there anyway so it hides pretty good but yeah so this is a house i think this one's over in spanish fork um and i've i've laid out their zonals but check check this bottom part out they've been taking top plate zonals and that's that's what uh shad's talking about here is they're they're drilling little holes into the walls and they're actually doing a zonal in bedroom one bedroom two bathroom one they're kind of picking a couple of areas just to see how leaky is that wall which really they're trying to figure out how connected is the interior of that wall to the attic and uh, and then they're they're doing pre and post. And as you can see on this house, they started out with some some numbers in the teens and in the 20s and 30s, and they were able to drop those down substantially. Um, now you're not always going to be able to drop every one of them. It looks like the master bath they they got a 12 pascal reduction. Um, but so what have you found, Chad? Like what kind of numbers do you usually see when you actually when there are some good opportunities? Um, what do you mean, like the zonal reading at the audit? Yeah, it, like if I if I got into a house and my zonals, it, the interior wall zonals were all like around a three to a seven. Is there is there much opportunity in that house or do you have a feel for that yet? When they're below, I would say below, yeah, like seven or lower it's it's i'd consider it pretty tight and the other thing you can do is get up in the attic and just kind of uh push some of the insulation back around the top plates and kind of see how tight the drywall is to that top plate um but i'd say once they get you know 10 to 15 pascals or higher then there's definitely opportunity to address them gotcha and then yeah speak to so once you've measured the zonals and you've identified okay like this house it, it looks like there's some pretty good opportunities now what did you guys do in this house or or what would you do in a normal house to actually seal this stuff up so in this house the only thing we didn't have very much money um we only had 140 dollars as you can see up there um so basically we spent $120 and that was just a couple cans of one part foam and labor to just get up in the attic and seal those top plates, all the all the edges around the top plates with one part foam and all the wire penetrations. And we ended up getting a 29% a reduction with only $120. Yeah, so you guys are getting up in there, you're actually moving some insulation around and air sealing uh, you basically your interior walls right the top plate on the interior walls wherever you can reach them is that right yep yeah so like on on this house you probably you probably were able to work here in the center of the attic because of the the height there but you probably run into some limitations when you get out further in the wings is that a safe assumption yeah you pretty much can only get as far as you can get where that slope comes down 
Um, you can reach pretty far, but you can't get all the way over, obviously. Gotcha. Very cool. So yeah, so this is this was a house built in 1996. Uh, they started out with the blower door of 1496. They got their blower door down to 1066. They almost got their 30% reduction. And as Shad mentioned, they had a very small budget for this. And uh, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, I, I thought that I walked this house uh, during monitoring a while ago. If not, it may have been one of their neighbors because I know there's a bunch of these houses that look the same. But uh, when I walked in this house, I didn't see a lot of air sealing opportunities. Like they, nothing jumped out at me, um, but I, I thought this was fantastic that these guys were able to recognize that all the air sealing was gonna be up in the attic on this one or a lot of it. And uh, and th this is the other thing. So they they spent of their 140, or they really they only spent 121. Um, they only 45 of that was materials, and they've got a material list here. So you can see there was some some foam, some foam tape, and then it looks like they also did some stuff with the door as part of their air sealing. But they're into this one about three hours in labor, and uh, you know basically. I'm, I'm assuming the majority of this was that you guys jumped up in the attic and and did some air sealing and and the zone will show it. The other thing I thought was really interesting is check out and and Shad kind of alluded to it a minute ago. Check out their attic uh, pre zonal. So they stuck a probe in the attic and the attic was at 45. Now we started talking about this attic zonal thing four, five, six years ago. And when we first started talking about it, we were wondering if 45 was a tight attic or not. Uh, and as you can see from this one, that was probably not the case because they got most of their reduction from sealing up an attic that started out at a 45 and they moved the needle to a 49. So let me move on to the next house here. I've got, I think I have five, five examples here that they sent me. So here's another house that they did. Uh, it was built in 1953, started out at 1907 on the blower door. They moved it down to 1407, so they got a 26% reduction. Uh, they had a small budget again, $225. They spent 204 of it, four man hours, $52 in materials. And you can see that it was foam and some caulk and some tape and stuff. And it says you had eight inches of blown fiberglass existing, you used a small rake and a hand broom to access all the top plates and plumbing penetrations. Uh, again, they started out with a pretty high attic zonal. It was a 43, they moved it to a 46. And they were able to do those top plate zonals on this one. And you can see that where they, so this is one where they had some smaller numbers. They started out with 10, 6, 7, 4, and they were able to move the needle on this one. Um, but maybe you can kind of see a, a little, they spent a little more and, and didn't quite get the reduction that they were shooting for. Um, so, you know, that might be a little bit of an indication of this one was a smaller opportunity. Is that safe to say? Is there any other details on this one that you guys ran into that you want to share? Um, on this one, one of the main things up in the attic was when I was doing the top plate air sealing, I found a, a drop ceiling above some cabinets. Um, and so that helped a lot. The other thing in this one was there was a huge return air in the attic that ran the length, most of the length of the house up there. So you couldn't really do much air sealing under that. I think there was only a couple top plates under that, but um, yeah. Gotcha. How did you address your drop ceiling? Like where where do you feel like you were able to do the most air sealing on that assembly? So it was just basically your sheet. I was doing the top plates and found some fiberglass bats and some that were actually had fallen down into that drop ceiling. Um, and then basically it was just, you know, capping them off and sealing around them. Nice. So was that were those in that drop ceiling where was uh, was there fire blocking, um, or were the cavities open right into the wall? They were open right into the wall. Gotcha. So you were able to move the stuff out of the way and actually 
basically plug off those those openings that go right down into the wall. Yep. Nice. And that's that's one to watch for because it you know, I framed a bunch of houses and that's that fire blocking gets knocked out. Sometimes it gets forgotten. It's so, you know, you may see that in some houses. Uh, awesome. Here's uh, house number three. And this was another one. Uh, Dalton and I were kind of looking at this one. So this was built in 1996. Um, and, you know, we thought we were building pretty good houses then. But uh, they, the pre-blower door on this was 2150. They got it down to 1097. So a 49% reduction. They had a whopping $220 to spend. So again, a small budget on air sealing. And they spent 217 of that. Four man hours, $65 in materials. And uh, I, I've i skipped over this number. I, I've got a slide in a minute. We'll talk more about this number. So, um, and I've got an average number that'll probably be more meaningful. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, so, so foam, a bunch of caulk and some weather strip. It says that there was 18 to 14 inches of blown fiberglass existing. The center section was matted down. They used a rake and a hand broom to access the top plates and the plumbing penetrations. Um, now on this one, they don't have those um, those interior wall zonals, but again, take a look at their attic zonal started out at a 44 and they moved it up to a 49. What did you guys find on this house? Do you guys remember any details on this one? Um, this one was another one that was just pretty much attic air sealing, really. There wasn't many opportunities besides that. Gotcha. I know, uh, Turner, I know me and you reviewed the audit on this one, and there were some notes in there from the auditor where he had not really identified any opportunities there, still besides the attic, and he was not anticipating as big a reduction as they got. Oh, yeah. Based off his notes in the audit, so um, it was really effective. They actually got a bigger reduction than they planned on just by that attic air ceiling. Yeah. Um, Shad, are you seeing, like, when you get up in the attic and start moving insulation around, are you seeing, like, the wiring penetrations just not foamed or sealed at all? Or are you seeing a mixed bag of that? And and you also mentioned that you'll like you'll look at the gap between the top plate and the drywall. Like, what uh, what are you seeing there, and how do you gauge that? Yeah, most of the time, it's actually pretty rare that we find that anything's foamed in them, even in the newer houses, like this one, ninety six. Um, but yeah, the the gaps. I mean, once they get up to the the zonal on the wall cavity, once they're above 20s, a lot of times the gaps are quarter inch or bigger. And um, there was one house where I could actually see at the right angle, I could see down that, that gap directly down the wall and I could see light coming through the baseboard. Interesting. All right, let me, so here's house number four. So. This one was a 1960 home. Their pre-blower door was a 3,000. They were able to drop it down to 1745, so 42% reduction. Uh, their budget was bigger on this one, 450. And hang on, I got a kid bugging. All right, guys. Um, yeah, so they spent just under $400. This one had some more labor in it. So uh, nine and a half hours and $37 in materials. So some foam, some caulk, and some sheetrock. So as they start out with nine inches of blown fiberglass existing and used the rake and the broom to clear off the top plates. Uh, their attic, their pre-attic was a 43. They moved it to a 47. And then, so they had a hallway was eight, bedroom was 25, bedroom was 17. And so they were able to move that needle as well. Uh, any details on this one that you guys remember? Um, 
This one, I believe our strategy was attic air sealing and rim joist sealing in the crawl space and another foundation. There was one circular hole where there was a fan that was in the kitchen at some point above some cabinets that had been removed. Um, that was probably a six inch hole that was into the, you know, just directly into the attic from the house. Um, and this, that 42% reduction was actually also adding combustion air after the work was done because we failed worst case draft test on the water heater. Wow. So you guys went and plugged up a bunch of holes and then you still had to cut another hole into the house and, and you still got a 42% yep. reduction. Yep. Yep. Impressive. Mm. Awesome. Let me move on to this last one here. So here's an older home, house number five, 1922, single story. So they started out at 1267. They were able to drop it down to a thousand. Uh, they got a 20% reduction on this one, had a budget of 150, spent 142, three and a half, three and a quarter man hours, about $14 worth of materials. So some foam, uh, foam tape and some caulk. And uh, this one says that there were some R19 fiberglass bats existing, move the bats, access the top plates. And this one looks like there's no interior wall zonals. Uh, but again, they started out with an attic at a 45, and they moved the needle to a 48. Uh, you got any details on this house? This one was kind of the same thing as that last one. Um, we we did a close blow on the walls, sealed the top plates, all the did all of our air sealing, and then the water heater failed worst case draft test. So that 20% reduction is with also having to add combustion air after air sealing was done. Gotcha. And then, um, did you feel like there was a ton of attic in, uh, air sealing on this one, or do you feel like you attribute some of that to the closed bill you did on the walls? How, how do you feel about this one? Um, it was quite a bit of attic air sealing, but it was nice because it only had those fiberglass bats, so it, it went pretty quick. Gotcha. Those are a little easier to move out of the way, huh? <laughs> and this is another house where I looked at it and it's like, I'll bet they had some room to work here in the middle, but I'll bet things get pretty tight down here in the, in the wings. So, but, um, but yeah, I just, just, I, I really, really appreciate these guys kind of just trying stuff trying to figure out how to improve stuff and, and actually getting up there and, and, uh, and, you know, getting their hands dirty. And, and I feel like, I feel like they've found some really good opportunities that we may be overlooking. I would really encourage everybody else in the program to, to take some time, measure these things, look at your results and, and try and find the things that are the most effective and, you know, I've been operating off of the assumption for a long time that a attic at a 45 Pascal, uh, you know, whether it has a big, a big uh, vent or not, I've just been thinking, oh, it's probably a pretty tight attic, but it's impressive to see on, I think on every one of these houses, they started out there and, and that's where all their air sealing was. Uh, uh, here, I did a, just a quick comparison of the, these, and I, I just call these the MAG-5. So these are the mountain lands, the, these five houses that we just looked at. And I just put the averages together here. And then I compared them to the state averages. And these are all the jobs that have been turned in since July 1st. There's, uh, so there's a pretty decent chunk of jobs here, um, but I just want to do a quick comparison. So, and, you know, and mind you, MAG has turned in a, a bunch of other jobs. These are just the five that they pulled and, and these, these may be the shining star examples. I don't, I don't really know. I just asked them to pull some of the jobs where they were able to do some attic air sealing. Um, but so the average age of the home was 1965. The average for the state is 1972. So, so we're dealing with pretty similar in age, maybe slightly newer on average across the state. But, but as you could see in those two homes from 1996, they still got some amazing reductions. Um, 
their average reduction of, of these five jobs we looked at, they got an average of 33%. The state average right now is 20% for everything we've turned in this year. Uh, this one's a little concerning. Please uh, check your air sealing and look for ways to improve it because this, uh, this is not where we want to be. Um, average air sealing material. So this is, I, I wish we had a better way to show you Right now, we don't report materials and labor on the air sealing. You guys probably have a lot of that data in your files at your agencies, but I don't have all that data at the state. So I, I would like to have been able to say the average cost materials plus labor, but I, I just didn't have the data. So the best comparison I could do is that this was the material cost that on these five jobs, on average, they spent about $42. The state average is about 104. Now, that you could be tipping the scale where you spend more on materials, but there's less on labor. Um, but the next number will kind of show you that, that that's really not the case. Um, so th this next number is taking those materials, the amount of materials that are put into the job, and dividing that by the number of CFM that you reduced. And basically, these guys were getting, for every seven cents they spent in materials, they were getting one CFM reduction. Whereas the state average, in order to get that one CFM of reduction, is spending 17 cents for every one CFM. So um, all indicators are that this is less expensive. I also did compare the it with the labor, and I, I found very strong indication that the total cost of this is drastically cheaper than the total cost of of the state average but i just don't have good clean data to show you that so anyway so those are the averages um i i in talking about this dalton's going to take us through a couple of things that uh from some past trainings on air sealing does anybody have any questions on these jobs before we jump into that I think Nelson had a question, Turner, in the chat. Yeah, I'm just reading it right now. So Nelson's asking about the on the last two jobs, the numbers went up a little bit. I'm assuming, oh, are, Let's switch. I, I, I think he's asking why did some of the zonal numbers go up and some of them go down? Because typically you'd want to see the zonals go down. It depends on whether, uh, in some instances, you want your zonals to go down because you're trying to bring that space into the condition space. In other instances, you want that zonal to go higher because you're trying to push that that space to the outside. So, like if I was if I was working on a, a garage a garage is a great one if i started out with a like a 40 and i, I want to make sure that that garage is completely outside so i'd want that number to go closer to a 50 but but if i'm working on bedroom number one i want that number to come down closer to zero um is that oh he's got master bath zonals increased oh i got you so he's wondering why this number has gone up anybody have any guesses as to why that would happen why would the zonal on the master bath go up? They put a fan in. Yeah, that'd be my guess. Is that if if you either went in and put a uh, replaced an old fan with a new fan and put a four inch vent instead of a three inch, or you just install that ashray fan in the master bath, that might answer that question. So I think that's probably that, that's that's my guess, but. Anyway, all right, let's jump into the, the last little part of this. So Dalton, I can just, if you just wanna tell me when to advance your slides, if you wanna. Yep, yep, that'll work. Um, yeah, I'll keep this kind of short, but um, so in 2017, Turner and I went out to a HPC conference in New, I think it was New Orleans, no, Nashville, in Nashville and uh, Turner sat in on a, a guy that taught about a study that Owens Corning did on air sealing. And I know we've shared this data with you guys before, 
um, but it kind of backs up what we're seeing um, happen there at MAG and kind of reaffirms that it it's not really just a fluke because there has been a study that kind of proves that um, air sealing in the attic is most effective. Um, and they conducted, they, their, their goal of their study was to find out what areas are most effective for the least amount of money to air seal them. And they took over, I think it was over a thousand different readings and they took some on some props in their lab and they also had a 1400 square foot home with a basement that they that they were uh, comparing the readings to also. Um, and they just ranked, they ranked uh, each method based off of um, the amount of leakage and the cost to seal it. So, and these are the results that they came up with. If you'll turn to the next slide, Turner. So the most effective um, areas to seal are duck boots going through the top plate, um, your top plate to attic joints, um, and then your recessed lights, and then your band joints. Those are the ones that you're going to get the biggest reduction on for the least amount of cost. So when you're talking about some of these jobs that we have that you don't have a big air sealing budget, that's why that's why this going to up in sealing top plates is so important because you're actually more likely to reach your reduction goal and stay within your budget. Um, and then the next, you can go to the next slide, Turner. Um, the next most effective, and this kind of follows our priority list that Turner has already gone over. Um, you, these are the moderate ones is the sheeting, the plate top and bottom and plate to subfloor. Um, we don't seem to get into those areas a ton besides the, the bottom plate. Um, and then your least effective is um, your, your windows, door framing to sheeting, your bottom plate to slab, um, the top, the exterior top plate corners, and your vertical sheeting seams, which we don't get into some of those just because it we already have siding on. But I wanted to bring this up just to drive home the fact that from what we're seeing at MAG with their efforts of sealing top plates and what you know this study kind of backs up, it is it is the area we need to go in and in work is up in the attics on on air sealing. So um, and with what Turner showed you about our our average numbers currently with blower doors, really try to see how you can uh, start incorporating that into your air sealing practices. So that's that's all I that's all I have, Turner. Awesome. All right. Um, our hour is spent. Does anybody have any questions before we end the meeting? And if you have anything, you're you're welcome to reach out to us offline as well. Uh, I I want to thank everybody who let me uh, share some photos and stuff of things today. I want to thank the guys in Utah County for all the work they've been doing. Um, it's been I because I'm close. I've snuck out and and worked with them a little bit lately, and um, they're it's it's been a lot of fun. They're they're looking for opportunities, and and uh, I think they're having some fun and learning some things along the way too. So thank you guys for all your time. Go hey, ahead. Would um, Jake or you guys down at MAG, would you um, be okay with us sharing your um, phone number or email with the other agencies so they could reach out to you guys if they had questions on, on uh, air sealing top plates and stuff? Or is that that's something, fine. I guess in the chat somebody can put if they're interested in that. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's fine. It's a good idea. If, Shadow, you know, what, if really good insight. you want to get in touch with these guys, just send me a text and I'll forward their info to you. So there you go. Awesome. Uh, well, again, you guys, please be careful and be safe. Like the numbers, the COVID numbers are really high. 
make sure you're following your agency's policies um, and make sure you're keeping yourself safe and your clients safe. Take the extra time to do that. Um, but yeah, be safe out there um, and let us know how we can help you. And uh, yeah, have a great day. Thanks, Matt.